All right, hey guys, I'm Dylan Johnson, and today I have on Deflating Atheism. Um, or welcome to Rationale Radio, Reasons for Belief. So, Deflating Atheism, well, why don't you introduce yourself real quick? Hello, I am uh, Deflating Atheism, uh, also known as, as Rob, and, and I have a channel I almost want to talk about in the past tense, but uh, I have a channel called Deflating Atheism where I would take uh, various uh, atheist uh pieces of propaganda whether it's from uh social media or youtube or 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 you know mainstream media or whatever and I, I would pick it apart and so i've not been very active uh as of as of like maybe a year or so i had some family things and kind of the the world started going in a different direction uh but i i'm i'm still here and i'm planning on on making a uh, uh produced videos again very soon even though uh, I've been doing some uh, live streams with uh, friends recently during the lockdown. So that's that's pretty much been my what my channel has been like for the for the last you know few months. Yeah, I've been a lot of stuff going on, a lot of um, a lot of useless riots, and and a, one per, one like white shop owner just got killed by a bunch of protesters. Like if they keep this up, eventually Trump's going to have to send in the military and. Eventually, these protesters will be risking their own lives by. Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, uh, I live, I live in a kind of small city. It's almost more like a town, Greensboro, North Carolina. And so I thought we weren't going to get touched by it, but uh, uh, downtown, there's a little strip of a little walking neighborhood of like boutiques and bars and, and, and restaurants. They all got busted in last night. So wow, it, it's tragic, really. And those are like small shop owners. I mean, I mean, you're not. Yeah. You're not Sticking it to corporate America, you're not sticking it to Target or or, or your know, AutoZone or something. Those those are local people who have their livelihoods in these shops. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I think um I think I was hearing today that um some store in Oklahoma some store or stores in Oklahoma City got um robbed or busted in today. I'm not entirely sure, but yeah, it's 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 going all over the place. Like they finally put. Derek in custody and he's being charged with third degree murder. Like what more do they need to do before these riots and protests stop? Yeah. Because eventually it's going to, if they keep doing this, then we're going to have a war on American soil where it's going to be the military versus protesters. And we do not want that. Like, I really don't want these protesters to keep up or else they're going to get themselves killed in the end. And I, I can make comments about the uh, hypocrisy of some of the people on my on my Facebook friends list, but I don't I don't want to get in that direction. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I can understand doing some actions to get the attention of the authorities, but like definitely ro robbing innocent people's homes or taking their stuff away is just not the right way, not the right thing to do. Yeah, and. I mean, again, it's it's uh, we could go right back at the Christian theology here. I mean, we live, yeah. we live in a fallen world. There is mm -hmm. always going to be injustice, and, and it, it could very well be the case. I'm not certainly not recommending this. It could certainly very well be the case that the the cop goes through the justice system and then he ends up acquitted. What are you going to do? You're going to burn down your town again? I mean, so it, it, it's you can't protest uh you can't protest the existence of injustice because there's always going to be injustice yeah the question for us Definitely. is how do you deal with injustice and i don't think uh burning down your own town is, is, a, is a feasible response yeah it's not gonna because all we're gonna do is create a war on american soil and we do not want another civil war that's what these protesters are essentially asking for is another civil war and of course or if they, or if they keep up, if they keep up, eventually we're gonna have or some sort of small scale conflict on American soil, which could lead, it, it it could end up like a domino effect and lead to another civil war, which we just don't want because yeah, I, I don't see that happening. I, I do think that the 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 kind of uh, agitators are pawns, but I think it's more expressly political, not. Yeah. Like you know, I think there are very wealthy people who are, who are kind of bankrolling this, and uh, they the the wealthy people who are bankrolling it uh, don't really care at all about you know black people or women or you know trans yeah. 
or you know whatever whatever your preferred victim group is and i think they're all they're all being used to kind of turn the turn the you know fringes against the center and to destabilize american society yeah definitely yeah yeah but for sure always going to be injustice in the world because of the fact that we had to re the fact that adam and eve had Adam and Eve had to reject God's covenant at the beginning. And of course, God was like, okay, I'm backing away now because you rejected my covenant. But of course, he's still yeah. going to remain involved because we because we, we need a most now at this time. Like with COVID-19, these riots, we, we seriously need him because we don't want these situations just getting worse. I mean, COVID-19, uh, we don't necessarily know what route that's going to go on, but the riots, you know, it's eventually going to have to stop or else the military is going to... If, if the media is any judge, uh, it happened exactly as Trump said it would, and it just magically disappeared <laughs> from the media response. By the way, uh, kind of opposite to this, I had a kind of revelation today uh, I thought this. I thought maybe you and 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 your audience would find this interesting. But I, I was about there's there, there's a girl on my, on my on my Facebook friends list, and she she posted this. Of course, this very famous uh, uh, verse from Ephesians: "For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against ru rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of the evil in the heavenly realms." Okay, so that has a meaning to us as Christians. But I was thinking, when you look at activism as kind of a surrogate religion, you know, as, as, a, as a substitute religion for the kind of spiritually denuded, I, I think they have their own substitute meaning for that. Because if, if you have a bunch of rioters who burn down uh, the, the small business of, of, of a black you know, business owner in Minneapolis or something, they think they're sticking it to the system. They're, they're not thinking about the flesh and blood person they're hurting. Yeah. So in their minds, it is not flesh and blood they're, they're railing against. It's this abstract thing, the system. So, so I, think, I think that's another thing where, where kind of activism uh, kind of becomes a substitute religion in that they, they have all the things a religion has – it's just they, they've just filled it with garbage, just with political partisan garbage, you know? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and it's sad having to watch all this because people – just you know, we wish people would be smarter, but, of course, we can't just wish all the dumb people would go away. <laughs> <laughs> well, well – uh, a person is smart. People are stupid. Yeah. So what's a famous? Mm -hmm. But of course, you can't fix stupid. So yeah, you you can politicize stupid. You can, you can use uh, stupid mm -hmm. to a desired end. Definitely. Yeah, and I got a stimulus check from Donald Trump, which is definitely going to help for tuition. Yeah, I didn't think I didn't think I was gonna get one, but <laughs> does does it have his face on it? <laughs> <laughs> it's like I, he's like, thank you for filling out your taxes. Here's twelve hundred dollars. I thank you. I I still haven't gotten mine, but I'm I'm not complaining. Yeah, I was. I mean, I mean, because I know I I know I work, and so I should get it, but I just I I wasn't. Just expecting, wasn't just expecting it to arrive in the mail all of a sudden, and then. But mm. you know, it's going towards tuition, so that's yeah, yeah. Good. I need it, and if I end up getting, if we end up getting another round in July, then I probably won't have any loans for this year, which would be awesome. Oh, <laughs> another round of stimulus checks. I thought we were talking about another round of COVID. <laughs> oh, hopefully not. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but um, but yeah, I mean that's the thing. It's it's uh like another reason. Like I said, I've had family problems, and and uh the basic uh Christian apologetics and shooting down atheist dumb uh <laughs> kind of taken a back seat to me now that you know politics, 
current events is occupying more of my mental real estate. So uh, uh, it's not letting up, but I see I don't have the discipline to do a, a current events channel because any time I would get around to finally making the video uh, about current events, it's like three or four days later, <laughs> in which case anything I wanted to say would now be irrelevant, you know? <laughs> yeah. 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 I can't. I, I mean, can you imagine like my hot take from four days ago? Can you imagine people wanting to hear my hot take from uh, last <laughs> week? No, it would be useless at this point. Yeah, yeah, it would. Yeah. I, yeah, my, response to John Steingard's deconversion is going to be like two weeks late or three weeks. But at this point, I don't even care. I just want to give my, give my take on it. But I, I, I've been kind of, so I've, I've, I don't think I really, I don't think I've never like gone on the internet and argued with other atheists. Cause I'm more, I'm always like reading a book. Like I'm always yeah trying to like, I'm trying to do something better than them. Like instead of them always trying to clash with Christians or other believers, I'm just like sitting on my bed, reading a book on, you know, metaphysics by Leibniz. Well, <laughs> there's a book, there's a book by Leibniz called, um, essays in, uh, metaphysics. It's like a hundred pages long. And I read a preview of it. I thought it was good and I want to get it because Leibniz is a really good philosopher. Yeah, I, I actually like his uh, his contingency argument more more than uh, Aquinas. Yeah, maybe. and I, I like his um, cosmological argument better than William Wayne Craig's because it gets to the point rather than... I mean, William Wayne Craig's is still okay. It's just yeah. I think Leibniz gets to the point of the argument. Yeah, uh, uh, so so you're uh, very young. See, see, this is the thing... Yeah, 18. When, when I was, like, getting motivated to, to uh, start my channel, it's like you could not get away from, from the atheists on the Internet. I mean, they, they – like, every, like, Facebook thing, there would be, you know, Invisible Sky Fairies. It, it's, you know, and whatever would come through, like, you know, Vice or something or, or some, some magazine like that. And you could not get away from atheist propaganda. So that's, that's what I was kind of responding to when I started my channel. Nowadays yeah. – if, if I want to find atheist stuff to respond to, I have to seek it out. It's and not just under my nose. Yeah, because the the reasonable Christians have started to take over the. Yes, exactly, exactly. And now, now, uh, even even if you know atheists don't know the uh, apologetic arguments, they at least hopefully know that you know invisible sky fairy isn't good enough anymore. You know? Yeah, yeah, you gotta. You got to attack the argument, not your own version of it. Yeah. So, which have you heard of um, Tim Red Pin Logic with Tim Barnett? It sounds familiar. So yeah, he recently launched his channel. He's already got like over ten thousand subscribers. But anyways, he's what he does is he takes like tweets or posts on the internet and he'll criticize them by like pointing out their flaws in logic. Like there is one. I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try to pull one up real quick well it reminds me of like what do you mean who who is uh, very successful oh yeah I, yeah i love what do you mean yeah he's a great guy let me see if i can find a um oh actually no he's got he's got he's got um 5.69 thousand subscribers but um he does have eight to get people to think but it, it is okay yeah i want to so Atheist Forum posted, if God is immaterial, what is he made of? If he isn't oh, made of material, then does he exist? H how do so many people believe he exists but can't describe what he's made of? So what Tim Barnett did is so he squared, so he put material in squared by definition because God is immaterial. And then he circled made of, and then he said, God isn't made of. On composite, yeah. Yeah, God's not composed of any parts. So and so, that's an incoherent question. So yeah, it just doesn't make sense at all. So, but well, they're, they're, they're assuming their conclusion that God is is a thing in the sky, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. And then his second point: um, if he isn't made of material, then does he exist? Tim Barnett calls circular reason reasoning. Uh, the question subtly assumes materialism. 
Yeah, 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 it kind of does there, I see. Um, can't read the other thing there. But then, but then they, But then, of course, they say, how do so many people believe he exists but can't describe what he's made of? It's like confused complaint. You don't need to know what something is made of to know it that it exists, like gravity. We yeah. don't know what that's made of. I mean, see, I, I don't even know what what atheist forum is, but I've I've heard that uh, I've heard that objection like two or three times in the past, and it's one of those things where your jaw just hangs open. You know, it's like I thought, I thought I had heard all the dumb counter arguments, but you know. It's like somebody asks, if God is a material, what is he made of? Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, I think you kind of uh, answered your own question. He isn't, yeah. made of any, he isn't made of anything that's in this world. Yes. He's, uh, he's what you would call a metaphysical. Um, well, he's not, well, irreducible. I mean, he's not. Yeah, yeah. He's, yeah. he's, yeah, he's irreducible. You can't, you can't compose him to, or you can't break him down into parts. He's a, spiritual being like the angels except he's much higher and much more complex and he's yeah like infinitely dimensional essentially so well well i i mean there there's an interesting question it's probably uh, irrelevant is is you know uh, angels and stuff i mean you could you could say that they uh, are, are material in maybe a different sense because uh so uh, I truly believe that 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 the that the uh, master's house has many rooms, and that we're basically uh you know well there you could access other rooms, but that's getting into kind of yeah. yeah. So I read the Unseen Realm by Michael Heiser. I've kind of done a little bit of studies on angels. I also have a book called Angels by him. I have I haven't read it yet because I'm currently trying to read How Reason Can Lead to God, and then at the same time. I'm reading On the Reliability of the Old Testament by Kenneth Kitchen, which is very, very complex. The first chapter covering kings and chronicles is just giving a list of all these kings and rulers. And what Kitchen's doing is essentially just drawing from archaeology and historical accounts that cohere with the biblical account, which is good. So I get the main point. Archaeological discoveries are happening on like a monthly basis now. Yeah, so... Yeah, so that's that's a good thing. But um yeah, I've got a lot of books that I have that I need to read. Um I don't know why they're on my bookshelf. You know, I should I I, I should have what I what I should do is I should keep them on my table. I should keep them on my table. And then the bookshelf is for like some it's it's something I have to earn. Like yeah. putting it on a bookshelf. <laughs> I have to earn it. Oh, you, you, I'm, I'm I'm essentially cheating right now is yeah, fi- finish what's on your plate, then you get dessert. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, then you get dessert. There you go. That's that's a good way of putting it. Um, but what was I going to say? So angels, with my studies on angels, in fact, I made a video called "Why Did God Create Satan?" So I don't. This is why I'm not a Calvinist because, of course, if God predestines everything, then God is pretty much the author of evil. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of hard to get around. I don't think yeah. you could really do so. But, of course, from an Arminius perspective, if God created Satan, then obviously he had better intentions for Satan. He created Satan for good purpose. He created him as Lucifer. Yes. And so he had good intentions for Lucifer. But, of course, when you look at it from a possible world's, if you look at it from a philosophical perspective, you see possible worlds or... I'm sure there are possible worlds where Satan didn't rebel because if there were no possible worlds where Satan didn't rebel, then that's pretty much determination right there. Yeah. Of but, course. I'm, but I'm pretty sure there were possible worlds where Satan didn't rebel or however, well, all, all you have to say is that there's, there's nothing logically incoherent about, about Satan not rebelling. And then there you have yeah. your possible world. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, the term Satan doesn't necessarily mean um, Michael. What Michael Heiser has noted is that this is actually a, it means accuser. So Satan is really just an accuser, which means there could be other accusers out there like Satan, but we just don't know it. Yeah. But the point of freedom is that freedom. Where there's freedom, there's going to be rebellion. Essentially, if you give creatures freedom. 
then you're always going to have rebellion, which means you can't really avoid it. So obviously we had angels that rebelled because um, I don't, we don't know how many God created, but obviously if, even if you created 100 angels, you're still going to have those who rebel. Yeah. That's just, that's the, that's where I see it from is that the reason why we have rebellion from angels and from us, of course, is that freedom is just, where there's freedom, there's rebellion, essentially. Yeah, yeah. And of course, I believe the angels have free will because of the book of Job and what, how God charges the angels with folly or mistake, yet yeah, mistakes. But of course, that's more of a, um, I don't exactly know how he judges angels, but I mean, of course, we're, since we're in the fallen state and since we chose to be away from God's presence, then, you know, we're more bound to sin than the angels because the angels are constantly in God's presence. And so, and they're not in a fallen state like we are. And so. Now, now there, there's an interesting question. And uh, I know uh, Alvin Plantiga ha has probably addressed this uh, <laughs> uh, amply throughout, like even like the 1970s. I mean, but uh so if, 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 you know, if evil just goes hand in hand with freedom, uh, are the people in heaven free? And if so, is there, is there evil and suffering in heaven? You know, so that, that's, that would be like a, a good objection to Christianity. You know, honestly, I don't know exactly how to address that. I know it has been addressed by Alvin Plantiga at least, but yeah. So there, there are, there are like, kind of smart objections but you know you what book does he um address it in I, I i i can't tell you i think probably several several papers and okay and okay yeah because i think so aside from are we free in heaven well of course since heaven is a choice then if you choose to go to heaven then it's essentially how you know we see God as a free agent. He freely chooses the good. Yeah. Once you're saved, you should be freely choosing the good. Yeah. So when you get to heaven, we should be freely choosing the good. Yeah. It should just be an emergent effect of our good. And since we'll be in God's presence, we're not going to be in that fallen state anymore. We're going to be in his presence. So we're still going to be doing the good. Gotcha. Gotcha. That's, that's how I see it. Now, of course... It's kind of interesting that angels can make mistakes. Like, I don't know what kind of mistakes they are, essentially. But you know how we make mistakes as a Christian, or as Christians? Although, God's not necessarily like, okay, you made this one mistake. You're going to hell now. because yeah. you're No, no. We're still Christians. We're, we're going to make mistakes, but we're still saved. And we still trust Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And we still know that it's bad, what we did there. But we did it. We didn't intentionally do it. We, you know, it was unintentional, or we didn't mean to do it in that sense. So, I think it has to do with if we're saved and we sin, but we don't intentionally sin or don't intentionally keep sinning, then you know we we still have our salvation, obviously. Yeah. Much like how the if the angels sin. Or if, if there's an angel who made a mistake, we'll just call it a mistake since that's what Job explicitly tells us is mistakes. Then I, th I I would say that it's minor mistakes, but it's not like they're it's not like they rebel or anything. Yeah. Of course, he had those fallen angels who rebelled, but that was it. Deny the Holy Spirit or something. Yeah. Denying denial of the Holy Spirit. Denial of um. Of course, isn't that deliberate? Like, does it have to be like deliberate throughout your whole life until you uh, die, pretty much? Well, I, I mean, again, this is not really a question I'm qualified to answer, but yeah, I've heard people say like, like, uh, even even the even the verse, you know, the fool says in his heart that there is no God. Mm -hmm. it, it's not not like an intellectual proposition. It's it's like a, a, a rejection. You know. Yeah, it's a it's a deliberate rejection of God. It's not 
it's it's not like they're unsure of God's existence or don't know he exists, but yeah, it's a deliberate rejection of like yeah. how the demons deliberate deliberately reject God. Yes. So what do you think of um divine hiddenness? Because I've done a little I've done some research on that as well, and I've actually come to some pretty interesting conclusions. So how I see divine hiddenness is you know how some people think this is like an empirical argument? Like it's just like, okay, since God has doesn't like reveal himself in the sky or anything, therefore he probably does not exist because or some atheists, like maybe atheist republic will be like, We can't see God, therefore he doesn't exist, you know, all these stupid, not well thought out arguments. But they you see, they think it's empirical. But the problem yeah. is is that you have all these religious people, including myself, who have claimed to have an experience or who have had religious experiences. Yeah, well, the problem was with the premise. I mean, you could just say, I reject the premise that God has not, you know, made himself, yeah. revealed himself or made himself manifest. Even, mm-hmm. even visually or auditorially, I mean, I think I think he has. I mean, so so it's, it's a... Well, because... How I see it as more of a subjective argument because, in fact, uh, Kyle Allender from Christian Idealism put it in a good way. If if arguments from personal experience for God's existence are not valid arguments, then arguments against his existence of yeah. like not seeing him or not feeling him are not valid either. So technically, divine hiddenness argument isn't valid because it... It's it's a subjective art because because people think that well God should always show himself in the sky. Well, we have to remember God's not like a physical being like us. Yeah. He's a spiritual entity who communicates in many different ways. He could he could show up right in front of you, but of course wow. you can't just command him to do what you want. First of all, second of all, God can command through flowing thoughts. Um, he can come. He can speak through dreams, feelings. You know, it's. He's got those many different ways of communicating, but to demand that he reveals himself in this bodily form, like the Damascus Road, it's just not going to happen because yeah, yeah, or just just as a matter of spiritual apprehension. I, I, I mean, just walking walking through the day, you you just feel God's presence. I mean, yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah. Uh, it, what you said reminds me of a, a genetically modified skeptic. He said. He, he, he realized that all personal uh, experience is not to be trusted because he learned about the scientific method. It's like, okay, so when, when a science uh, when a scientist is performing an experiment, how else do they learn the results of their experiment except through their personal experience? I mean, so it's, it's a ridiculous uh, self uh kind of standard of truth to say that that personal experience isn't valid, you know? Yeah, much like how... When an atheist says, well, God hasn't revealed to me. God hasn't shown yeah. me anything. So therefore, he probably doesn't exist. I mean, if we can't use our personal experience as an argument, you can't either. It's just, yeah. Yeah. it goes both ways. So that, I, I think that's a pretty good argument against divine hiddenness. I also think, um, so I go by Alvin Plantinga's um, Divinus, uh, sens- t- no, Divinitatis Census or whatever, whatever you call it. From yeah, his book, um, apprehension, yeah. Yeah, senses divinitatis um, from his book, Knowledge and Christian Belief, how belief in God is properly basic because you have, well, for example, you've have you seen IP's new video on um, the ancient monotheism documentary? Uh, I, I wanted to watch that. That looked interesting, yeah. Yeah, so ancient cultures back then had belief in one God. And it wasn't just because they saw patterns in nature or anything. It was much more than that. They knew it deep down that there was a God, much like how children or babies also have that intuitive sense of the supernatural or that there's something out there, something higher power. And this would be the sensus divinitatis or properly basic belief. However, since we're in a fallen state, I mean, we don't, we're not necessarily going to always like feel that like we're going to know it's there. Yeah. But some people will think that they don't have it because we're in that fallen state, of course. And it's because they, because they're deliberately denying God's existence or not accepting it. 
then they're probably not going to see it because they haven't accepted it first. Mm. But I think the fallen state does have something to do with that. Why some people don't think they see God or have that sense of the census divinitatis. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I was. I finished up um, Seigart's book, "The Works of His Hands." Have you read that? Uh, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, man. I, I, I've <laughs> I've been writing music recently. I've been writing music. Hey, that's that's good. That's good, right? <laughs> what but kind yeah, of music so, are you writing? Uh, I actually write classical music. Yeah, mm -hmm. but uh, so uh, a lot. Like, I have a whole bunch of things. I mean, I need to read. I have I have like Ed Fazer's book. I I need to read that. Is it the uh, five proofs of the existence of God? Yes. Yes. I, I, I want to read that one. I really do. I, yeah. It, it's got some good reviews and unique arguments. I've never heard them. I've never heard of them except for the first cause argument, but I've never heard of the other ones. Uh, well, well, I mean, the whole, the whole genre of argument is called first cause. I mean, I mean, there's not one first cause argument, you know? Yeah. And, well, and it's called um, in the Aristotelian sense. So, yeah. According yeah. to Aristotle, there there are five different kinds of causes, but uh, or four different kinds of causes. I'm sorry, but yeah. So so it's 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 all of them, and and they follow a similar form. Now it's kind of ridiculous is that is that sometimes skeptics seize upon this fact and say, well, you need four separate arguments. Why isn't good enough? It's like, well, yeah, one is good enough, but <laughs> it, it's it's the, you know, the the classical arguments. I kind of think about it as you know the allegory of the blind man's elephant in that yeah. where yeah. One, you know one man has the leg and one man has the tail and one mm -hmm. man is and they're all describing a different you know animal but but they're it's actually just the same elephant so that, that's yeah. what i feel like the, the first cause arguments are is that they're uh, uh kind of describing different aspects of, of god's primacy so yeah uh and and, and it's good to know all of them for the simple reason that it's interesting to know true things. I mean, you can you can have uh, any probably two hundred different formulas for uh, uh, you know computing the 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 value of pi. You don't need two hundred formulas for computing the value of pi. They're interesting to have, you know. So yeah, I, I think that objection is, is kind of silly. And, and, and they use it to trivialize it, like, oh, you, you don't think your know, one argument is good enough? Yeah, it's like, no, we we have multiple arguments. No yeah. need one argument. <laughs> but um what was I gonna say? Uh oh, we were talking about Ed Phaser and then the and the Yeah, I I was gonna bring up something, I just can't remember it off the top of my head. I hate it when this happens. <laughs> Yeah, I, I know, I know. I, I had I had a brain fart with my last with my last uh, live stream, and I it was embarrassing. I couldn't remember I couldn't remember the name of FDR. <laughs> I didn't want to say FDR. it. I just completely blanked out <laughs> FDR, which is like yeah, you know, I could if if it was like, like Jeopardy or something. Oh man! Oh man! I can't remember it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so so it's embarrassing when that when that happens. Yeah. Yeah, I think I. No, I don't. Well, you know, you know, uh, live streaming one hundred and one. What when you do have a brain fart, you can go into your comments. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, okay, so Ethan Silva comment. What do you guys think of the euthyphro di dilemma and the problem of evil? I'm not. I keep forgetting what the euthyphro. Like, I keep looking up the definition. I keep forgetting it for some reason. So it, it's like if God is willing but not able to. Oh, those it. those paradoxes. Yeah. Yeah, those, those those don't work anymore. Right? Well, well, like like two two of the objections are valid. But like the third, if 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 God is if God is you know able to prevent evil, but doesn't. oh, so it's actually the problem. Okay, I thought I at first I at first I was thinking that can God oh, create really? so heavy even he can't lift it? No, no, no. But there there there's another one. Uh, it's it's you know is is. Is the good good because God wills it, or is the yeah? You know, oh, okay, I've heard of that one. I I haven't done both of, them, both of them are flawed. Yeah, yeah. Well, I would say that God is good, like that. 
he that good's not just like it's God, God. More than, good is grounded into him, much like how morals are grounded into him. Yeah. It's not that God arbitrarily decrees the good. Yeah, he doesn't he doesn't command morals. He is the moral standard. Yeah, yeah um the problem of evil, so but I think well, about the problem of evil. What you're saying about the, about that singer. And who uh, I, I never even heard of, but yeah. Who would be the A the, the singer who deconverted, yeah. Oh yeah, because he brought that up. Um so the problem of evil. So how I see it is that first of all, well, you have freedom, of course, human freedom. But not only that, so essentially it not only goes back to original sin, the fall of Adam and Eve, where they rejected God's covenant, but rather Every day since then, humans have rebelled against God. And we have to remember that God is not only just pure love, but he's also a moral judge, too. So he doesn't let sin go unchecked. So judgment is essentially a, it's kind of a response to the rebellion that we've done and the damage that we've caused. Um, that's one way of looking at it. Um, so, of course, when people bring up this ar- of course, when people bring up this argument of well, like why all this pointless suffering, is because everybody's having to face the consequences of other people's actions every day. Because other people are, con- I mean, we're all okay. Well, not everybody, but you know, there are a lot of people out there who are constantly rebelling i mean think about it It, we could we could easily cure child hunger but instead we spend our money on useless things like gambling or self selfishness is what causes rebellion essentially it's just it's not if we would all just be selfless we wouldn't be having these problems but of course since of course since humans are selfish and they want to rebel and they want to not care about other people God allows like natural evil to happen or natural disasters or God or God just allows evil to happen in general because it's just a form of it's a form of his divine judgment. Yeah, I'm good. I'm going to have to say I I, I always think uh, a person is on thin ice when they say God does X because of Y. I I think I think there's a little bit of presumption in that Uh, I'm. I'm very happy just to kind of put it out into the great unknown. You know, I, I can't, I can't say, you know, yeah, God could banish Lucifer. God could eradicate evil. He does not That doesn't mean he's easy. That does not necessarily entail that God is evil, certainly, but I don't know why God does certain things. And I think, I think a Christian apologists, uh, they, they did, don't do them any favors by, by kind of trivializing the problem. And, and I mean, I, I I do think that's a real. It, it is, in my opinion, the problem of evil and the problem of suffering are the only really valid uh, atheist arguments. They're not they're not logical arguments, and so and so you're not really addressing the the issue when you say, well, the logical problem of evil, you know, is isn't valid. Well, that does that doesn't mean that people still don't emotionally register them. You know, and I, I can't I can't provide people with a pat explanation of, of why, you know, God allows evil or suffering that's just, you know, gratuitous. It's that it doesn't have to be from any person's agency. I could be taking my my you know jog through the woods and a tree just falls on me. You know, it happens. So I, I mean I, I think the danger there is in, in kind of overly rationalizing it, you know. That that's my opinion. I, but I, I think maybe the best counter argument is, is is the one of proportion. Say that in the you know, eternity of heaven, all, all the all the suffering that we experience in this life could be like you know stubbing your toe on the on the on the you know coffee table or something. Yeah. Now, yeah. now we we could imagine. A person who stubs their toe on a coffee table that cries out, "Why would God permit this? <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> it's a comic. It's a comic mental image. We we would laugh at that. <laughs> So maybe that's maybe that's what we're doing in this life is that we're stubbing our toes and then crying out what what evil God could, could permit such suffering. So I think maybe just you know understanding uh, the suffering of this world in the context of eternity is uh, maybe the strongest answer to the to the problem of evil and suffering. Yeah, and um, of course, like you had the apostles who. Like you would think oh, they yeah. accepted Jesus, you know, their life was going to be easy. God was going to do everything for them. And now you get Paul who was like, what beheaded Peter was crucified. They were tortured, beaten. So, I mean, we have to keep yeah. that in mind right there. And of course, Jesus crucified, he, you know, he was crucified as well. So, I mean, that's just the, the reality of evil. It's, I mean, these guys were good people who were preaching God's word and yet yeah. they were, they had horrible deaths. I mean, of course, they're, and that's why that's why I see it as likely that maybe maybe it's just human rebellion that's always caused. Because the thing is, is in the Garden of Eden, people kind of have a misconception about this, but the Garden of Eden wasn't originally created as this like. It's not like we were given immortal bodies from the start. We still had. I mean, in the ancient Near East, dust meant like frailty and transience, which would mean fragile. Yeah. So, but now the tree of life, though, on the other hand, gave us that um, eternal life, essentially. Like God put that tree there, so we would have, so we would, so we would have that etern, so we would be able to live forever. But, um, sorry, I'm lost track there but god gave us everything at the start to make this planet eden because we ha how i think of it is that the fact that we have physical bodies is a gift because angels don't have physical bodies they're just spiritual beings much like how we're spiritual beings but of course we have physical bodies and we have a physical earth to live on and of course, this planet is our home. It's not like God's just going to destroy it all in the end. We're going to be in some, we're going to be in some ultra hyper dimensional state. You know, we're going to be on this planet at the end of the age, whenever that is. And it's going to be like it's going to be in a glorified state. It's going to be like Eden. But of course, um, and of course, our bodies are too. We're going to have resurrected bodies. So essentially, Earth was. God didn't make it perfect at the start. He made it good, but he was like, hey, there's still there's still work that needs to be done. And so yeah. I'm going to partner with you guys to tame this creation. But of course, after we rebelled against God, God was like, OK, now you're going to have to face these consequences. Like, I'm not. I created this world to work with you guys on it. But now you're going to have to face the struggles of the world since you chose to deny my covenant with you or since you chose to deny my covenant. Mm. And of course, yeah, human freedom, I mean, has a big thing to do with why there's evil in the world. But because like you have, well, why does God allow Satan to exist? Well, God works with humans and even angels in a progressive way. Like he's not just like, he's going to annihilate Satan or the other angels out of existence. Eventually they're going to be put in the place where they belong. But for now, God's God has a certain way of dealing with things. Yeah. Essentially. I mean, he's his relationship is progressive. And so he, I mean, he uses Satan to get his will done, to get things done that he sees are good. I mean, well, why not? that's kind use of, Satan for good things, essentially. That's kind of the 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 answer of just kind of I think uh, most 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 theology is that is that God allow God allows evil to achieve a greater good. Even then, we okay. don't. I don't think it's it's necessary to pin down what that greater good is. Yeah. So, like, I, like I said, I, I mean, I don't think 
uh, uh, pedanticism is really, really the answer to the argument. I mean, that's that's what I think. Like Plantinga says, is just be there with the suffering. You know, don't don't try to you know slap a, a rationalization over it. You know. Yeah, because. But yeah, God God works with um, not only fallen angels. Um, mishaps, but our mishaps as well to bring about good things. So when Satan rebelled, or when Satan and the other angels rebelled, I mean, he saw opportunities to bring good things out of it, even yeah. though they were going to cause misfortune. He still saw this as a chance to bring good things out of it. Now, of course, the angels, they were already given their divine punishment at the beginning. So it's not like they can be forgiven because their judgment is eternal, but he can still use them to bring about, he can still use them to get good things out of it. So he sees opportunities. And of course, if you look at it from a philosophical perspective, um, possible worlds is that wherever we want to steer off or the angels want to steer off, God is, I mean, he's got, he's ready. He's ready to, he, He's got, he has good ways of responding to these situations. Yeah. Essentially. Yeah. I, I don't know what, what you were saying before about the, the apostle suffering is I had a very, I had an eight hour live stream with the fabulous agnostic who, even though his name is the fabulous agnostic, like we see eye to eye on like 98% of everything. But that's, he, that's good. He, it, it's, it's, an, it's an entertaining, uh, he's a, he's a, such a great guy. I've uh, probably spent more time talking to him than pretty much everyone in my real life. <laughs> but uh, like what are the one thing that I wish I had spoken up against, because he's kind of, he's kind of like a, a Jordan Peterson acolyte. And so he's, he's very much into the kind of Petersonian view of Christianity. And so what he sees in, in, in Christian theology and that he thinks that uh, insufficient attention is paid towards is that he thinks Christianity is is a program for living your best life. Now, now, if you know like Jordan Peterson, that should that should be ringing some some bells. Yeah. So he said, well, no one ever says that. Yeah, if you live according to these tenets, uh, you will have a good life. I'm like, no. <laughs> look, look yeah. at they they would have lived their best life by just going along with the Romans. So I I, I mean that that's kind of nonsense. That's one of the few things where where I really. I wish I had kind of jumped in and said that, but yeah. Yeah, because because this world is rebellious. I mean, Jesus promised he didn't promise that, okay, I'm gonna you know, I'm any any time, you know, a rebellious person tries to, you know, do something to you, I'm gonna annihilate them out of existence. No, he never promised that. He actually said, No, it's gonna get hard for you because yeah. since the world's against me, if you're gonna be for me then the world's going to be against you too. And it's just something that because they have human freedom and because I've allowed them to rebel, I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to be with you. Okay. But I'm not just going to annihilate them out of existence because he's given them that freedom to rebel. So, um, so Ethan Silva asked a question, how do you think um, morals are grounded in God's nature? Cause I don't quite know that. <laughs> well, I, I think, I mean, that, 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 that's a tough, that's a tough metaphysical question. I mean, since I, God I mean, is... it's, it's, it's like, you could say that like, you know, goodness and truth and beauty are actually the same thing, just kind of differently understood. They, they all, they're all one in the unity of, of God's nature. And the, as we said before, the kind of non-composite nature of God's existence there are just different ways of apprehending the same thing. I wonder if they would just be an emergent effect of God's character, like morals and stuff are just an emergent effect of who God is. So they're still grounded in God, but they emerge from God in the sense that they're not, it's not just the divine, com it's not just like a commandment, like, okay, I command no, that you do this, but rather they emerge from his character because yes, they're grounded in him. I mean, I, I guess that's a good way of looking at it, but. I don't know. I, it's it's a, a question I do not feel uh, 
qualified to 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 answer. Yeah, me either. I need to read more philosophy before I can fully understand that. Of course, maybe if I finish the reason for God, I can. Or no, no, not that. Um, how reason can lead to God, then maybe yeah. I might have a better understanding of, because I don't. I I haven't studied much up on ethics. Um, I was before I decided to start over with philosophical foundations and just study it, because I was trying to read it all the way through. I got to the ex. I got to the ethics part, but then I was like, okay. I want to memorize, like, I don't want to just read it. Like, I want to know it and I want to understand it. Yeah. So that's why I decided to study it instead. So now, of course, with On the Reliability of the Old Testament, which I'm reading now, I'm I'm not attempting to try to study it because it's not, it's not like it's, I mean, it's good to know. Yeah. But I don't see it as necessary to like go in depth study on it. Like all the names and dates and you know. The, the, if it's the, if it's a textbook, then you want to study it. But if it's not, don't don't even try to. Yeah. And it looks like Slam RN, my moderator, just joined. So. Yeah, I, I have a I have a huge uh, blind spot, especially with the, with the Old Testament and with history in general. That that was always that was always a weak, a, my weakest uh, subject. Yeah, because I I feel like I'm always studying the New Testament rather than the Old Testament. Because I mean, I I like Genesis though. I mean, I study early Genesis, like creation, Adam and Eve fall. Because I mean, like, they're interesting chapters, but you have. I mean, in Kings and Chronicles, all you have is a list of kings and rulers and yeah. what they did. And so it's not too interesting. I mean, it's good history, but I mean, it's just not that interesting to read about. I mean, it's not It's not like, I mean, I know some people are going to find pure like joy and entertainment out of reading it because they're, they could probably future historians or if they're not, you know, yeah, or if they're already historians, they just love history. But I mean, I well, prefer... Yeah, for the Hebrews, there wasn't any separation between the history of their people and their religion. They were they were one and the same. So I mean, yeah, I, it kind of gets folded into the same thing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's it's interesting, but it's um. You see, this book that I need to buy, I'm wanting to buy a textbook on the New Testament because. I want to have I want to have textbooks for almost like I want to have a textbook on the Old Testament, textbook on philosophy, textbook on the New Testament, and, you know, textbooks on this, these various subjects. That way I can study them because I may not necessarily get the best textbook in college. Like if I take, but um, but it's, it's going to be well rounded. Even, even yeah, if, yeah, because I don't in, think that um so. If I end up going to seminary and um, taking masters in divinity, I know philosophy is like part of that course. But the thing is, is I don't know what textbook they're going to provide from because it'd be nice if they if they provided me with philosophical like if philosophical foundations for a Christian worldview was the textbook we had to read from. That would be like great because it's written by the two most prominent figures in the field. Yeah. So, of course, the reason why I don't necessarily read from or the the reason why I'm buying these other textbooks is because they're written by prominent figures in the field. And you don't necessarily get that in college or it depends on what kind of college you go to. If you go to like, you know, Southern Nazarene, they may not, you know, give you a textbook like that. So. It's like a f interaction going on in the comment section. That's good. Yeah. Hopefully, um, although seminary is not like a guarantee for me yet, um, it'd be nice to be nice to go and get the experience. Mm. So, 
Man, no quit. I wish I wish we just had like a list of ten questions that we could answer. Like, uh, <laughs> well, you're doing good. Yeah, I could just make up questions. Here. I could just make up questions. Who created God? Checkmate theists. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah, I love I love the fact that there there is so much counter snark coming coming from uh Coming from a you know Christian like I like I, I just read Facebook I don't read Twitter or anything like that but yeah, yeah. There, there are so many snarky uh you I mean Christian meme pages and, and it's it's just giving all the snark that Christians have been getting for years and just putting it back in the opposite direction <laughs> now sometimes they're like even like too crass for me which is saying a lot. <laughs> Sometimes they're a little too snotty for me, but you know. <laughs> yeah, capturing Christianity put forward an argument like if if um dogs is if dogs exist then God exists. Um dogs exist, therefore yeah. God exists. And I commented, I was an atheist before I read this post, and now I'm a Christian. Did did, did you say uh did you see my comment? I said uh yo uh, you, uh, you can imagine a good boy who's who's uh what's it yeah <laughs> the the good the goodest possible boy yeah a, a boy so good that that there can be none gooder yeah yeah um yeah on the reliability of the Old Testament is what I'm reading right now and then Richard Bauckham's Jesus and I witness yeah I actually um I read that at the very very beginning of the year but I thought I wanted to start off with the more basic, um, more basic. Um, let's see. I have okay. So I have, I have reinventing Jesus and uh, dethroning Jesus and trusting the New Testament. So I thought it'd be easier to start out with books like those, and then Jesus and the Eyewitnesses with the last book I finished on because it's like, it's kind of like Kitchen's book. Honestly, it's really um, a lot of, a lot of scholarship in it. For sure. It's still a good book, though. He's got some groundbreaking work. And my phone went off. <laughs> so that, that would be uh, about both the life of Jesus and the resurrection? I think so, yeah. I haven't actually... Um... Yeah, um... I think so, because I only read, like, I think I read, like, or I think I might have skimmed through, like, half the book, and then I was like, okay, yeah, I think I might want to, think I might want to return to it later when yeah, I yeah. understand it a little better. Like, I went, I, I tried reading, like, before I got into all this book reading, I'd read Cold Case Christianity, and then I decided to go straight to um, George W. F. Hagel's book, um, phenomenology of spirit and i understood nothing of it so i actually enjoy, i actually enjoyed phenomenology of the spirit of course oh you read it you read it before years yeah but uh I mean, it's, it's it's more interesting than like kant or something like that i thought so yeah yeah sometimes they can sometimes they're just really boring to read from you know it's like like what is all this but I, I think there's actually a, a, a bit to recommend uh, Hegel's view of history, even though even though he kind of that kind of went into like Marxism. And I think that Marx actually perverted it because Mar Marx was Mar Marx was a, a what the, what did he call it? A materialist dialectic. But when 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 Hegel talks about the spirit of the age, he's not using like figurative language. He was an idealist. He really believed the age was a spirit, you know? Yeah. It's a lot more interesting than, than the legacy that, that came from Marx. And I think uh, Hegel's comments about how societies uh, change over time and how they develop, I think there's there's a lot of value to be mined from that. Yeah. So it looks like Ethan Silva's trying to get into apologetics. And yeah, so... Try try not to start off with like Kitchen's book or Richard Bauckham's book, but I would recommend you start off with um, a good apologetic book. 
Let's we'll start with Craig. I mean, you know, he, you can he, start with William Wayne Craig because well, yeah, he's at all levels. Yeah, start with um on guard because he's a professional po- philosopher. Unlike you know, I mean, Jay Warner Wallace is good, but he's not like he's. I think he well, went he, to seminary. A, a particular method towards it, you know. Yeah, he yeah he's got an interesting approach though for sure, but yeah I would I you see I've never read On Guard before that's that's the thing I I've, I've only been reading Philosophical Foundations but I would say yeah you could start off with that book, um, and that'll get you kind of start kind of started into Christian Christian philosophy yeah. and apologetics because when I got into apologetics it actually um. Well, after I got saved and I got into apologetics, because I was into apologetics even before I was saved. And then after I got saved, you know, I kept getting into it and then I kind of left it for a few months. And then when I got back into it, I really wanted to like learn more. So I got into book reading and that's been, that's been, that's been pretty good. I I, I like book reading because it's been, um, it's meme reading. Yeah. (laughs) Once you know what you want to read, you'll read anything on it. (laughs) Yeah, Slam RN says I've been into apologetics for thirty years. Yeah, I mean, I mean, good. I mean, that's excellent. Yeah, I've only been in this is like probably my third or fourth year into it. Like yeah, I started, I, I started I, off as a freshman, or I, it was my freshman year where I actually like learned some apologetic arguments. But it wasn't until after I got saved I really got into it. You started out with Hugh Ross, yeah. Well, it's good that you didn't start with Kent Hovind because <laughs> that's where I that's where I started. It's Kent Hovind. That was a bad idea, but I'm glad yeah. I left Young Earth Creation when I did. Yeah, see, like I don't even know. I don't even know if I knew what Christian apologetics was ten years ago. I, I just knew that uh, what atheists were saying on the internet was kind of self evidently stupid. Quite <laughs> yeah. a hell started out not with any sort of specialized knowledge certainly i still don't have specialized knowledge but so many of the things the atheists were saying at the time it was just really starting to come to like a a head on the internet 10 years ago it was it was self-evidently stupid it's like you know what is god made of you know or something you know the you know the bible calls bats birds it's like come on but yeah so so it started from that and it just kept for me it just kind of started snowballing started off with um i found about true apologetics from ip yeah that he yeah he influenced me for sure he really yeah. influenced me after um because at that time i was into i was into kent hoven jay warner wallace frank turek um inspiring philosophy but out of all of them inspiring philosophy has had the biggest influence on my faith um kent hoven's probably had minimal influence now because i I mean, I kind of rejected a lot of the ideas that he constantly um, advocates for. But I'd say Inspiring Philosophy, J. Werner Wallace, and Frank Turek have had the biggest influences on my faith. But nowadays, I only, like, I don't even watch, like, apologetic videos from, like, J. Werner Wallace or Frank Turek. I mostly, like, anytime Inspiring Philosophy re- releases a new video, I watch that. Yeah. But I mostly just read. Now, because because you know, if you if you go back ten years, I mean, internet apologetics wasn't really a thing. It was more yeah. internet atheist apologetics, you know, defending their lack of belief, which is I don't I don't understand why they need to, especially when they if because if they claim to have a lack of belief, then why are you constantly arguing trying to defend your views when you? Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I, I mean things, things like you know, you know, you know, quantum idealism. It's interesting. It's good to have. I don't think it's necessary. Yeah, you know, I could kind of take or leave it. But you know, the thing about IP is that he's he's such a good debater. Yeah, he, I mean he 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 he's just a beast uh, in, in debate, and so that's that's I mean just so excellent, you know. Wait. Those guys are determined. Oh, so is Kent Hoven like a um? Is he like a Calvinist? Or does he believe that? Does Kent Hoven believe that God has determined everything? That'd be interesting, though. Because yeah, Kent Hoven. I mean, you don't even need Kent Hoven nowadays. All you need is a little hologram of him or 
videotapes of him. And it's just those same arguments that are going to be repeated. So literally, you don't even have to debate Kent Hovind in person. All you have to do is deba- just, just, just what you do. Here's how to debate Kent Hovind. Play some of his videotapes. Respond to all of those arguments. And then when you debate him in person, he'll just be bringing up those same arguments. So, Yeah. Uh, another, another thing I don't like, and, and I actually had a, a, a guy I know uh, kind of do this this kind of script. And uh, I, I told him I didn't like it. And I found out that he had fallen away from the Christian faith later on. But it's, it's the whole, uh, you know, Ray Comfort, have you ever told a lie? Then you're a liar, you know. That thing, it's like. Oh know. yeah, that gets kind of. Um, it, I mean, it, I like that. I like that. That's why I don't really like his approach. I mean, I like that he's going out and he's preaching the gospel, but yeah, yeah. his 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 rhetoric. I mean, his repetition of words there just kind of gets old, and it, it, I I kind of cringe honestly. Like, yeah, probably start. Probably change your approach there. But yeah, quantum idealism is. I have I have like three books on uh, quantum mechanics and idealism because I want to get more into it because at first I thought about kind of going away from it because I didn't think it was really necessary. But honestly, I think it would be something good to study because it's a philosophical topic. I mean, it's been a philosophical topic. And then, you know, you have some people who, you know, in IP's debate with Tom Jump, um, Tom Jump kept asking him, you know, go convince the scientific community or, you know, the science, the, the consensus of scientists needs to agree on it, but it's not just scientists. It's also philosophers who specialize in quantum mechanics. So when in IP's after show, when he brought up how we could go off the consensus of philosophers of religion is because idealism is a philosophical topic. And, you know, I like how, I like how this is what I was going to bring up actually. Um, I like how, these internet atheists are always saying how science is superior than philosophy and science gets us more like science is more truthful than philosophy. Well, the thing about science is science is always changing and evolving. We don't know what kind of new theories or new facts are going to be out by tomorrow, but philosophy has pretty much remained consistent since like, like arguments for God, like um, the moral yeah. argument yeah. or you have, uh, yeah. arguments from aristotle or aquinas i mean those have been around for centuries and have not changed or yeah. at least if they have they've been like upgraded or they've been refined but scientific theories are always changing so well he's actually uh, more certain the the atheists uh say something that's actually kind of contradictory they say that a- that science is the surest route to truth because of the fact that its findings are always provisional, <laughs> it's, uh, which is contradictory to me. It's okay because since it's always, uh, since its results are always in doubt, that means it's the surest route to truth. That doesn't really make sense. Yeah, that doesn't really add up. That's why. That's why I believe that philosophy is like philosophy is more guaranteed than science. Well, yeah, because well, I mean, I mean, science itself is is predicated on certain uh, metaphysical foundations. I mean, so, you have to you have to apply. Um, in fact, I think before you can even do science, you have to have some sort of philosophical approach, because like the scientific well, method. Yeah, whether you know it or not, you're you're yeah. making, you're making uh, metaphysical assumptions. Yeah. So, like, if you say that there is, um, what was it? I'm trying to remember it. I'm trying to remember it. Um, by, by the way, can, can I just jump in here? Because Slam Moran says something. And so just 110 years ago, Einstein even thought that the universe, where, where did it come? Okay. Was so, static. <laughs> yeah. And that's. That is true. true. Yes. So uh, this this is what's ridiculous about the the whole uh, science is replacing religion argument is that that might have been kind of somewhat defensible 150 years ago. Nowadays, because Darwin didn't know about how the proteins 
of, of, of you know DNA work. He didn't know that was a, a computer coding and decoding and you know self-repairing information system. The the people of the of the late 19th century didn't know that that the universe began at, at, a, at a you know point in time 14 billion years ago which uh you know gave credence to the kalam argument they didn't know about about the design of biological life or the fine tuning of the universe because of what we know in the 21st century not because of what we don't know what we know in the 21st century we have more reasons to believe in god because of this uh scientific discovery than we did 150 years ago so that's, yeah. that's what the absurdity of the whole uh, I think Neil deGrasse Tyson, I'm sure you've heard him say, is that like, you know, every bit of scientific knowledge, you know, paints God into a smaller and smaller corner. That That's just a lie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ethan, isn't saying science is more superior philosophical? And yeah, it is more like to say that there's no truth outside of science is a philosophical claim. Yeah. It's not a scientific one. A scientific claim would be like, okay. So cells replicate. That's a scientific claim. Um, and this is what they call first order and second order facts. A first order fact would be like um, cells reproduce. Um, a second order fact would be how can we do science or does science get us to truth or that's 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 really a meta question. Yeah. 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 So when you say that, when you say that there's no truth outside of science, you're essentially um, I think you're kind of, I think you're, yeah, you're, you're definitely making a philosophical claim. In fact, specifically, you'd be considering that a second order, um, fact, but yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely a philosophical claim. So. Well, like, you know, you know, I wish, I wish people atheists are always claiming that they're the ones with intellectual modesty. I wish there was a bit more intellectual modesty from science popularizers like Neil deGrasse Tyson and Lawrence Krauss. That's what I'm saying. A universe from nothing could have been a very interesting uh, uh, popular science book if he had left all his metaphysical anti-God garbage out of it. It could yeah. have been a very valuable, interesting book. Instead, he made it worthless. Pretty much, yeah. And you know what's funny? Like, if an atheist claims there is no truth and yet claims science gets us to all yeah. truth. <laughs> like, congratulations, you contradicted your entire statement. Yeah, yeah. It's it's irrational. You, you can, you can, yeah. you know, you can laugh at invisible sky fairy all you want. Uh, yeah, what I, you believe is, is provably illogical. It's provably incoherent. Yeah. Yeah. So when you say there is no truth, you're making a philosophical statement, or if you're saying that philosophy, or or if you or if you even say that philosophy gives us no truth, that's still a philosophical statement. I mean, or it's all just a matter of opinion, man. It's like okay, you obviously know nothing about philosophy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but either way, I mean, you can't you can't get around philosophy, even if you try to say philosophy can't give us truth you're still making that philosophical claim because yes. philosophical claims can come in many different varieties but a scientific claim is one that deals specifically with things about science anything outside of that it'd be considered philosophical in nature like like okay what's the best approach to science that would be a philosoph that'd be more of a philosophical question or like how is the scientific method good? You know, that'd be another yeah. philosophical. Yeah. That, that's another. That's another aspect to it because the having a workable results uh, from from kind of a, the scientific method depends on you reporting your results honestly. Mm -hmm. it, it it depends that yeah, I I think it's good. There's a morality that's that proceed as well as these metaphysical assumptions. There, there's morals and ethics that go into uh, into producing good scientific results. Now, as we know, uh, there can be a lot of uh, corrupting influences in in science in you know the scientific method. Yeah. If someone's paying you to to arrive at a certain conclusion, that's not good. You can't get usable results that way. 
So yeah, I, I mean, you have to have some dedication to truth, which is itself a moral a moral stand. Yeah, it's like Bible for truth. Common to atheists usually are created due to false Christian. Yeah, a lot of a lot of pretty much almost every atheist I've seen has come out of Christianity because of some sort of like like John Steingard, for example. I mean, if you read the article on his convert or his deconversion, you can see that. He wasn't really, well, he wasn't really saved to begin with, first of all. That's what I discovered. Of course, the objections weren't really, I mean, nothing new. But, yeah. but yeah, it's usually some form of, like, they weren't actually saved or they were, they had a false, under, they might have had a false understanding of God or they maybe thought it was forced to them as a child. I mean... I know, it's, I'm sorry, but that's kind of what I think is I think happens a lot of times is that people are born and grow up in in a, in a Christian environment and aren't even exposed to uh they, you know they just kind of go along with the flow and aren't exposed mm -hmm. to to something that would challenge their faith and then uh, when they finally hit that thing that challenges their faith they think that oh well everyone who thinks for themselves goes in this direction that I went into but. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I think I think it's kind of it's kind of like a vaccine. <laughs> it's like you you probably need to inoculate your kids, you know, and that's why I think if you're raising them in a Christian environment. See, this is another thing is I, I'm obviously a, a, a bit older than you, but there in, in the 90s, there was definitely a, a sort of evangelical pop culture. Yeah, I mean, it still exists to some degree, but not quite like it was in the 90s yeah. where kid could just grow up and by the time they went to college they were never exposed to anything that was not you know in, in this kind of christian pop culture bubble now a lot of times i think what happened with new atheists is that they were those kids who grew up in in that kind of coddled environment where they they were never exposed to anything else then suddenly the the merest thing hits them and they're like oh no everything i believed was a lie they think that uh you know Maybe the like the music videos or something. It's like throwing out the theology is just like throwing out the music videos or something. It's just part of a lifestyle that they throw out. And so that's that's what I think was really the the breeding ground for for new atheism, in my opinion, was this kind of unchallenged uh, uh, Christianity of, of the sort of evangelical bubble. Now I think nowadays uh, there there are so many. I mean, there are so many good Christian apologists. Again, uh, kind of blanking out. It's like with uh, FDR, but yeah. Jeez, uh, oh, I, I can't remember who who's the guy who who does the uh, who does the kind of touring Christian apologetics thing. The teenagers. I'm sorry, I'm just blanking out on his name. Touring. Yeah, he just does the little presentations in front of churches. Oh. No, I, I, I YouTube channel. Yeah, you can see him on YouTube. Yeah, I mean. Capturing Christianity? No, 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 no. Uh, uh, I, I'm blanking out. But yeah, it, it's like just being exposed to that. Uh, it's so embarrassing. I I mean, it's it's a very, very approachable. It's not, you know, not, you know, especially tough stuff because the, the atheist objections aren't particularly tough stuff. But I think seeing that for a teenager would be uh, sufficient to inoculate them to 99% uh, of atheists dumb. Yeah, I'd agree with that statement, Swimmar. And yeah, that, and if, if, if an atheist was raised to be an earth creationist or if, or if a, or I should say Christian, actually, if a Christian was raised to like deny evolution and then they go off to college and then they see the evidence for an old earth or they see the evidence for evolution, they're convinced by it, then they're like, okay, well, everything I was taught as a child is wrong, so therefore I don't believe in God anymore. And, you know, it's such a minor issue, too, since yeah. the Bible isn't isn't a science textbook. Now, we still believe that God is the author of life and the author of the universe, but, I mean, I mean we have to look at the biblical writers, for example. The biblical writers believed the earth was flat. And that there was a solid I, I, I don't know about that, dude. Well, they definitely... Well, I mean, the writers of Genesis believed that there was a solid dome above the earth. And, I mean, the ancient... 
people in the oh, ancient Near East. Well, well, the the all the authors of the go uh, gospels who came after uh, uh, Pythagoras, I think, were were aware that the that the Earth was a globe. Well, like especially Genesis authors, um, or just if you look at the culture um, of the ancient Near East at that time, they had. No, no, the Hebrews did have a perception, yeah, that, that the earth was flat. Like, well, like, and obviously, the Hebrews flat. believed, like, obviously, then they believed in one God, but then around them, they had, there were all these polytheistic cultures. I mean, but still, people in the ancient world back then believed that, like, mountains, the sun, the moon were gods, and the firmament was a god. I mean, that's just how the ancient, this is how the ancient world was, but the point of the Bible is not to, um, inform us on scientific facts, but give us theological truths about God and revelation. Because if God were to come down and say, okay, I'm going to teach you about gravity and quantum mechanics, and I'm going to teach you it would about, have been sense, yeah. about human evolution, then they'd be like, uh, yeah, cool. Can <laughs> <we>? <laughs> it's like, I want to go back to my garden now. But, yeah, well, that's that's uh, what the modern day atheists would just call word salad. <laughs> I also think um, 9 11 may have had a contribution to um, new atheism. Yes, I agree with you entirely. And I also think uh, the fact that the president at the time, George, George W. Bush, uh, was an evangelical and he was quite unpopular. And I think that gave a little more fuel to the fire. By the way, the, the guy's name I was looking for before was Frank Turek. He's the guy who does the little. You know, oh yeah, Frank Turk. Yeah, cross examine. I like, I, like I, I think everything he does is great, but it's it's at a very approachable level, and I think yeah, if, if a teenager sees that, they're they're good as as far as protecting them against you know dumb atheist arguments. Oh yeah, Frank Turk is because he gives short videos and he answers these questions like really he he always has logical and clear answers to some of his questions. I yeah. mean not all of his questions, but, but like a lot of his answers are really logical and precise and clear. I mean, that's because if, if like I were to give an answer on a really complicated question, then, you know, complicated questions are going to need comp or even if it is a simple question, I mean, sometimes simple questions actually require complicated answers. I mean, yeah. just how it is sometimes. Uh, of course, sometimes complicated questions can have simple answers. I mean, it's well, just, that's, that's especially a problem with like live debates is that you have to kind of compartmentalize what you're going to say and what you're going to have to leave unsaid if you ever have to read some like academic text or something. Yeah, it, it gets difficult. Yeah. Uh, Genesis wasn't written down to Moses. Uh, uh, according, to, according to tradition, yeah, uh, Moses was the author of the first five books of the Bible. Mm -hmm. Not actually in the Bible itself, but it's according to tradition. Yeah, yeah. That's another another quite one of the uh, many problems of a uh, sola scriptura. Yeah, yeah, and also so what John Steingard said about the um, so what he said about the Bible not being um, divinely inspired. So he he mentioned that well the Bible's not perfect; it was written by humans, therefore. Since it was written by humans, it's not the word of God. Now, of course, I don't know what he was taught as a child, but he must have been taught that the Bible came directly down from the sky or something. Because yeah. to say, because I don't even think the biblical authors claim that this came directly from the sky. I mean, I'm pretty sure, I, I don't know where, I'm pretty sure there's a verse in there that talks about, um, I can't remember though, but I know that, the the Bible never talks about this just being some just like perfect book from the sky, but rather this is inspired by God and written by humans because God works with humans to get his will done. So yeah. he works with humans to write his book down and, you know, but I mean, we still believe it's inspired. I mean, that the theological truths in there are. Yes, but it, it's inspired, that, divinely inspired does not necessarily mean divinely dictated. You know, yeah, it, yeah, and, and there could still be or, errors in there. Like there could still be simple human errors in there, but it doesn't affect divine inspiration. I mean, it can still be from God. I mean, like now, this John Steingart. He actually said he was an atheist, right? 
Yeah, although he, he did say he's still open to the idea of God. However, he did openly confess to being, a, being an atheist. So. You know, that's another thing that bugs me. It's like, okay, I have problems with the Bible. Okay, well, that means that you're not a Christian. That's, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, if you have a problem with the Bible, then... Yeah, you could just – that's not a logical reason for becoming an atheist. It's, it's it, you know, If it were valid, it would be a logical argument for not being a Christian. You know, uh, Another thing is uh, you know who uh, uh, the, the good mythical morning guys are? Am yeah, I heard about their deconversion. I didn't I didn't like read about like the reasons why. I think – was it – were they raised young earth creationists or something? I, I Well, first off, they, they, there are two guys, so they both made very long yeah. videos. I didn't watch any – one of them all the way through, but you know, I kind, of, I kind of had an admiration for them. I th and they're originally from North Carolina, so you know, it's okay, it's good. You know, mm -hmm. boys made good, but uh, so I watched one guy's, uh, uh, I watched Rhett's uh, kind of, uh, you know, description, and I actually found him uh, sympathetic. And, and you know, at the end of it, it, it was, it, they said that they weren't Christians, and he says, you know, I look around at the universe and I think. It's a very valid thing to say that was designed by a creator. I'm like, okay, well, all hope is not lost, you know? So I didn't find it as as upsetting as I think a lot of people did. Yeah. But, yeah, the since the Bible was written by humans, anytime you have something written down by humans, there's always going to be some... Now, of course, the test, if it's divinely inspired, you have to see if the their conception of God is illogical and you have to see if the, like the stories are true, like the resurrection. If that's true, then that adds inspiration to the Bible, but we don't necessarily see inspiration as being um, di directly coming from down from the sky or something. We see inspiration as God wanted them to write this certain book down in the Bible or. Yeah. It's divine inspiration is a little kick in the butt that gets them to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Cause you have, and especially when it comes to the new Testament, they wanted books that were written down by like eyewitnesses preferably yes. of the resurrection. Like we have a Paul and um, even Jude. I'm yeah. Even Jude saw um, Jesus during his lifetime. So, I mean, if it was written by an eyewitness, then they were that gave them that kind of a, a gave them that kind of put them in that position to write to yes. write a book in the Bible. Or of course, the Old Testament prophets were very um, knowledgeable in God's, and they could really they really knew how to hear God's voice. And so, and, and another thing that atheists kind of fail to understand is that they think that the that the Bible that the you know, old and the New Testament uh, books alike uh, were written to convince atheists. That's not the case. No, they, that was not the case. They were written to people who already believed, but you know it has you know the tenets of the faith. You know it writes them all down, which is why the atheists say, "Well, the the Bible is a claim. The Bible is a proof." Well, no one ever said, no one ever claimed no one ever said that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, yeah, the Bible, I mean, John Walton puts it a good way. The Bible wasn't written to us, but it was written for us. Yeah. It was written for everybody. I mean, it's there for every, I mean, Christians, I mean, it's there for Christians to learn history and to learn more about their salvation and learn more about God. And it's also there for atheists, too, who want to read it and maybe um, get something out of it. But it's not written just towards, like, atheists. It's, oh. it's not the, I don't know where they got that claim from, but. Oh yeah, Elijah. Yeah, Elijah went to the dead. Yeah, and that's the thing is back then they they really knew how to hear God's voice because they constantly like constantly put themselves in isolation. But nowadays we're always on the go and we're always <laughs> yeah we're never we're never just in a spot of isolation. To I mean, it's a, yeah, there's a, there's always a YouTube video to watch or something. Yeah, gotta get a yeah. <laughs> yeah, although God God doesn't necessarily speak in an audible voice either. He actually speaks in flowing thoughts. That's why if we have a mind, he speaks he he speaks directly to our mind, so it's just for us to hear. I mean he doesn't necessarily have to speak through sound waves, but we can still discern what he's saying through our I don't know, our spirit or our mind. And so 
The Jewish Bible is a story of their people. And I'm no, not quarantined. Dude, that, the quarantine is so last week. Try, try to keep up with events. <laughs> no one. How, how are we going to keep up the pretense that there's still a quarantine? Well, because now we have all these riots going around, yeah. so they're definitely breaking quarantine rules. But <laughs> Just, uh, keep so, keep socially distancing as you, as you're throwing Molotov cocktails. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the New Testament canon was, of course, it started off as just all these different documents that were scattered around. Or, well, they knew. So they knew what documents were inspired, obviously, and they they did know about the um, forged documents as well, of course, when well, they were yeah, making there the are ways, There are ways of figuring that out. It's not like there was never any controversial. Yeah, yeah. Like, well, that when they were, when they were, composing the new testament canon it wasn't like that they were just fighting over which books they wanted they were trying to figure out which ones were i mean they had already accepted matthew mark luke and john i mean those were a priori in there because they knew them to be reliable it was the ones that they knew to be reliable and that's why you have the the gospel of thomas didn't make it in because it wasn't written by thomas it was written way later by a forger I interesting stuff but not not yeah really worthy of the canon yeah yeah, not worthy of the canon for sure. The Book of Revelation was, yeah, I think that was because they, well, because it was because it was different than the other books of because most, so the Gospels are telling us history, and of course, Paul's letters are about like salvation, and the pastoral epistles are giving instructions to pastors, but of course, Revelation stood out, but they still knew it was written by John, so it was still worthy to be in the canon because it had it had some sort of role to play. Yeah, John of Patmos was St. John. Yeah, that's a, that's a complicated issue right there. Um, so... There's actually external evidence that Revelation was written before John, believe it or not. But so how it goes is that John was essentially, he was banished to Patmos Island. And then <clears throat> once his um, banishment was over, he, <coughs> he was, um he went back to Ephesus and that's where he wrote, his gospel. So that's just, um, I can't remember exactly where that external evidence was. I have to, I'd have to find it again, but yeah, you can learn a lot from external evidence. How could we tell they were inspired? Like being consistent with what Christ taught. So if you want, you can go first on that uh no i mean i mean you you have at it i mean well inspiration is kind of a it can be complicated sometimes because to be inspired i mean when it came to the new testament it was a lot different than the old testament like i would see in like for the new testament for example um you were inspired if you were like an original eyewitness writing a gospel because you were you were considered an authority on um because you either you saw the resurrection or you interacted with Jesus during his earthly ministry. So that's I mean that's one way of I think that's I think that maybe that's one way that they were inspired is because they were eyewitnesses. Um and because they deliver truths as well to us about um now of course like the the um forged gospel of thomas wasn't accepted because obviously it was written later and it didn't give us any it's interesting of course but it didn't give us any divine truths unlike the earlier gospels which gave us divine truth so i think um delivering divine truth has something to do with that as well although it's not necessarily a um it's it's not it's I mean because anybody can give us a divine truth doesn't mean that they're actually inspired. So I think I think I think a lot of factors have to play with divine inspiration. 
I think it has to be like a calling too. Like you have to be yeah. called to put this book in the Bible. Like much like how pastors are called to be pastors. I mean, God calls, I think God was calling these ancient authors to put these books in the Bible. So yeah. And, and that's another way of looking at it. Yeah. You can read them neutrally and then, you know, they still scan as history. So, I mean, yeah. But yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of elements that play into inspiration. Um, let's see, yeah, Gospel of Thomas, Thomas was agnostic, uh, or gnostic. Yeah. Said, like, <laughs> <laughs> it's got this symbolic view of God. Well, well, there, there, there are many flavors of gnosticism. Yeah. And in fact, uh, one one of the one of my friends who who I actually interviewed on my channel, he's actually Gnostic, and I, I called him. I, I I referred to him as a Christian. He actually said that he doesn't want to be called a Christian, <laughs> even though obviously he believes in the, in the divinity of Christ. But you know, yeah, yeah. But um, let's see. Christianity proved itself of Gnostic texts and. Just like origin and Martian, yeah, and I, I'd say it's a reliability thing too. Like the Gnostic texts have mythological elements in it, but the Gospels are actually trying to portray history. <laughs> and of course, you can find that in Jesus and the eyewitnesses. I feel like I'm choking on something. Yeah, I think I think Gnosticism did deny um, that Christ was fully man and fully God, but only appeared to be God, or only appeared to be a man. Yeah, and then there are, there are debates about his resurrected body. <laughs> they were yeah. saying, what, "What is he made of?" Yes, it's a it's that old uh, objection. Yeah, what 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 kind of yeah? What's the what is it made of? Well, well, we'll know soon. We'll know sooner or later what our bodies are made of because we'll be we'll have ones, but. I would say it's uh, it's kind of hard to tell. Yeah, put that put that into the known, into the unknown. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah the unknown, like like the Trinity. We can't like we can't just logically explain the Trinity in simple terms. I mean, but it yeah. doesn't mean it's necessarily contradictory. That that's uh, that's another thing about about like atheists is that they say, uh, you know. Uh, you know, I have intellectual humility. I'm not afraid to say I don't know. Unlike those Christians who, who yeah. they know everything, but then those say the same atheists will say, "Well, in the Bible, in chapter this verse, this it says this, this, this. What do you have to say about that?" Uh, they're not going to accept. I don't know as an answer. <laughs> if yeah, you have um, humility about your your knowledge of of biblical or, or you know apologetic uh, minutia like that, they're not going to accept. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, and that's why I, I always try to give an answer for everything. However, if I you like truly don't know something, I will say, yeah. you know what, I'll get back to you on that. How about yeah. that? I don't know, I'll get back to you on it though. Especially when you're dealing with the Bible and there's a there's a lot of it, you know. Yeah, because atheists are always trying to find contradictory things within you yeah. know because cause cause they know that if there's a contradiction in God's nature, then he can't logically exist. But if if there isn't, then well, I, 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 I modal ontological yeah, argument. They're smart enough to. Well, I mean, yeah, they they try with like you know the the, the omnipotence paradox, but mostly yeah. they try, try to find contradictions in the biblical text. Yeah, right? yeah, and that's those, those are a lot harder to address without knowing everything there is to know about the Bible. Well, especially when you apply um, ancient near East, ancient context into play, then. I mean, the contradictions kind of go away. That's why when you when yeah. you misread scripture with Western eyes, I mean, it's easy to pick out contradictions. But whenever you look at it the way an ancient writer did, I mean, the contradictions do kind of fade away. But even if there, I know some atheists have claimed that, well, there's a contradiction right here in the Bible. Therefore, the resurrection didn't happen. I would say, okay, that doesn't logically follow because even if you could prove this was a contradiction, First of all, we could just apply the principle of charity, and second of all, it wouldn't affect the resurrection because you still have the minimal facts argument by Gary Habermas, and you still have other factors too. But yeah, 
but yeah, it needs a lot of cultural context for sure because you can get a lot of. I mean, you can twist. I mean, nowadays you can twist the Bible to like m- mean what you want it to mean. This is why we really need cultural context because it's not about it's not about your interpret. Michael Heiser put it a good way. It's like the the interpretation of the biblical text is not the Protestants, not the Catholics. It's not the um, it's not these biblical theologians. The original context is the interpretation. Yeah, there was a there was a big uh, kind of controversy in my comments when when I had a, a Wicked Felina, who was a, the guest on my last uh, chat, and she mentioned the the uh, Jesus throwing out the money changers and and the and the meaning of that, and so there's there's. There's some background knowledge you have to have to understand something like that. Awesome. Yeah, you're getting some new subscribers from my channel. I actually thought that they were subscribed to your channel already, but oh, well, I guess they weren't. So. Yeah, yeah. And they're, made, they're making it harder to get to get subscribers these days. Yeah, kind of. I've been... I wish I could get past... I'm I'm ten subscribers away from two hundred, so maybe maybe after this discussion though I'll get a few more. Yeah, I, mean, I, know, I was in a um because I'm part of the youth apologetics empire. Um, I was in a um podcast with Vocab Malone, and I probably got like twenty subscribers out of that. Maybe maybe more. Mm-hmm. Buying philosophy, I got like eighty subscribers, so that was that That's- was given, but. Do you believe in the Big Bang deflating atheism? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, insofar as the, the universe had a had a beginning at a at a finite point in the past, yeah. I I, I don't think that's that's uh controversial. No, yeah, because unless it's funny how Kent Hovind puts it's like the dirt exploded, and then here we are, but then he also says nothing exploded. So he's actually he actually contradicts himself there. Okay, what exploded? Nothing or dirt? <laughs> and first of all, it wasn't dirt that exploded because there was no space for dirt to exist in. Yeah. Rather, I would say that the universe emerges from quantum mechanics, and then if you apply idealism to this, then the um, universe actually um, the first person to observe the universe, like the reason why the universe exists anyway, is because it was observed in the past before we could observe it. Um, so that's why when you have, um, if the universe started up like a quantum computer, then that would actually be re- like really good evidence for God's existence because information has to come from an intelligent being. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, would, I, would, I would just say priority or uh, some, uh, sorry, go ahead. No, I, I would just say mind is primary. Yeah. yeah mind, mind for sure. Is it metaphorical or six stages? So there's a um, certain view that John Walton put forward. It's called divine temple and not, or it's called temple inauguration theory. So basically you see a lot of these patterns of temple inaugurations that take place, that take place over like maybe it could be six days. It could be six months, six years. Just There's always the number six in there. So what John Walton puts forward is that, um, the six days of creation is a temple inauguration. So it's not necessarily, it's not trying to give a material origin of things, but it's trying to, it's, it's trying to give a theological point. If you want to read, if you want to read more on that, John Walton wrote a good book called the lost world of Genesis one. I heard an interesting theory, so I'm, I'm I'm not necessarily endorsing this view. It's just it's just interesting. But uh, 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 Moses, who is traditionally believed to be the author of the first five books of the of the Old Testament, uh, twice he went up to Mount Sinai for six days, and so, uh, well, seven days actually, and and uh, 
you know, God revealed various things to him on these seven days. Now, if you know uh, Genesis, there are actually two separate accounts of the creation, of, of the seven-day creation. Yeah. Moses went up to the top of Mount Sinai twice for seven days. So could this just be the act of creation that was being revealed to Moses on those two separate instances? And it's not necessarily chronological, just different aspects of creation that were revealed to him. I don't know. Interesting. But throwing it out there. Yeah, and there's also the um I think it was I think it was J. Richard Milton who put the idea that Genesis reads more like a poem because it has poetic elements like yeah. um Lester Light, um Greater Light, or and God said. So there is poetic elements in there. I mean it could be a mix of both too. I'm not necessarily um I don't necessarily like subscribe fully to the divine temple inauguration view, but it is, it is a good possibility. But in the end, I don't see, I don't see Genesis as a science science textbook. I still believe that evolution is fully compatible with the Genesis account. It's just that, um, that's what, uh, like when, when atheists complain about like, you know, Job or something, like, Oh, the earth has, it says that the earth has foundations. Like, okay. Have you tried reading the surrounding text? The, the surrounding text is poetry and beautiful poetry at that. But you're going to pick this one thing and not even reading in context. <laughs> think that the, the earth is, is balanced on pillars. It's like, okay. I don't understand why they do. Like, it's just like flat earthers, man. You want us. Oh, uh, well, there are, the earth rests on literal foundations or pillars. Yeah. Or there's a literal. There's a solid firmament above the earth where nothing could get through. And the sun and the moon are not balls in the sky. They're lamps. And <laughs> the earth is flat. And <laughs> the, 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 the moon is not a light. The moon just reflects light. <laughs> it just reflects light, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's... You know, it's, it's so funny how, like... Like, why don't you watch the video of the recent rocket that went up into space from SpaceX? There's no fur because if there is a firmament there, then I'm pretty sure the rocket would have exploded as soon as it hit it. I don't but, think. Did you ever see the thing? Uh, a guy. Uh, it was a. It was an accident. The guy wanted to do uh, like this was before. Uh, I guess before uh, drones were easily affordable. He just he just wanted to get a really great shot with his GoPro. So he tied a GoPro to a hot air balloon, but then he lost it. <laughs> the GoPro just went up and up and up. And believe it or not, within 45 minutes, you could see the curvature of the entire Earth. And then the GoPro eventually fell back down to Earth. Someone found it, retrieved the footage, <laughs> and so you could see the roundness of the Earth from this GoPro footage. Yeah. All it took was 45, a 45-minute 45 ascent, and you, you could see everything. Yeah, they say NASA is the king of CGI. Yeah, I don't like. I don't understand why they want to be so against NASA. Like, what is that? Like, it, it just. You see, this is why I left Young Earth creationism is because, whenever they said that all these radiocarbon dates are wrong, I was like, yeah, I'm not buying this, guys. Well, no, that, that's another thing. If if it turns out that there's a serious flaw in our understanding of the past, that would be the least surprising thing to me. If, if the entire scientific understanding of, of the prehistory of the Earth is, is majorly flawed, I, I would expect that because, you know, everything we know of biology and paleontology, it's taking little things and making broad extrapolations about that. Yeah, I want to answer this question. So basically, evolution is a change in allele fre frequency. So basically, if you have a if you have a group of like a million different little like um, should I say we'll call we'll call this group A, okay? Group A. So let's say they're exposed to a pesticide and um like most of them die or most of them get mutations and then die. There's actually those few who benefit from those mutations. Like, of course, of course, most of them, probably 99% of them aren't going to benefit from the pesticide. However, 
that little one percent will benefit somehow. And then that's that's really how evolution kind of works. And it's not like it's not like humans just directly evolved from apes. It's more of a ancestral thing. Oh, okay, I'm gonna have to jump in here. Okay, so let's say there's a pesticide, just as a mutation, suddenly I, I have a yeah. lip. <laughs> here, okay. I have an arm going uh, on my neck. I need, I need nerves in it to control it from from my central nervous system, and I need to have a set of behaviors uh, adapted to this to this uh, newfound limb. So there's a, a bunch of things that need to be in place for this for this limb to be usable. Meanwhile, before we get to that place, this is a huge metabolic load. This is making me more vulnerable vulnerable to predators having this extra limb that I can't even use yet, you know? So, so it, it, it's, a, it's a little more complicated than that. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of factors. I'd recommend a good book on it. It's called The Works of His Hands by Dr. Seigart. Um, he gives a good... I didn't really understand evolution that well until now. I, I, I understand it a little better, although I probably need to reread the chapter on evolution that way I can understand it again. But yeah, that's kind of what I've learned about evolution. Um, Adam and Eve were made of sperm, but full adults and men lived a lot longer back then. Well, that's, that's taking a literal interpretation of the text. So we've been going on for, an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, do you want to go on for a little longer or do you want to like start wrapping, wrapping I think up? I'll start wrapping up, yeah. Okay. So we can probably see if there are a few more questions, Bob. If you guys have any questions, feel free to comment right away. That way we can answer them. Transformers. See if I can find some more uh, questions in the. Yeah, I, 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 I certainly believe in evolution. I think uh, the, I don't think random mutation nor the Darwinian selection mechanisms are, are sufficient to explain the, the change. In the yeah. Book. So I actually have this book, but I haven't read it yet. I'm gonna start reading it soon, hopefully, because I need to. I'm going to try to get on the reliability of the Old Testament finished. And then um, I've got Trusting the New Testament by J.P. Holding. And then I believe I have, I think, The Matter Myth by Keith Ward. And then after that, I'll be reading um, The Runes of Evolution. But yeah, I've, I've read his book. Um, I have read Life Solution, though. I didn't really understand it that well, but it was still interesting. Uh, okay. there, there's a, a question directed at me. I think it's towards me as a Catholic. He says, uh, "Can the can the Pope dictate a Bible interpretation?" No. Uh, I just say the papal infallibility just means that uh, he's the executive of basically the Holy See in in the same way that the president is the executive of of America. He's the, he's the highest authority, but still the 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 He's simply the inheritor of, of the kind of uh, deposit of the faith. He, he's not the dictator of it. Yeah, because he could still be wrong about his interpretation. Yeah. Or anybody could be. So, And after learning about the church fathers, I've actually, uh, it's kind of interesting how the papacy has gone back since then, since the early church fathers. Uh, the guy who loved the human gene, Francis Collins. Yeah. Yeah. How um, it's the language of God. Yeah, I have it. I haven't read it though. That has that has caused so many people to become Christians. And that was before New Atheism. That was that was before yeah. even the New Atheist uh, became a thing. Yeah, although some people have actually enjoyed Seigart's book more than, like, I know Inspiring Philosophy has described Seigart's book as like uh, the language of God 2.0, which is kind of funny but I, I still need i still i'm still gonna read the language of god because i want to see like his perspective on it but you're welcome ethan silva okay let's see sam harris mocked it oh sam harris 
Yeah, go figure, because I mean, this isn't really... Um... You know, well, I find it ironic. I'll tell you, uh, uh, Sam Harris has taken uh, out the important lesson of, of of Darwinism, at least, that if you don't adapt, you die. So he's he's adapted and he's now kind of a, a quasi new age uh, self help guru, I guess. So he's he's kind of guy, and he's the only one of the original uh, new atheists who really managed to stay somewhat relevant. So yeah. yeah. I find it funny how he believes that consciousness is like more than just the brain, but yet denies free will. And then you have Daniel Dennett who believes we have free will in a sense, but denies that we have like denies that our denies that our um our like denies that our minds are different from our he denies brain. that consciousness exists. Yeah. Yeah, denies that yeah, denies that consciousness is separate from the brain. I, it's it's a stronger claim than that, yeah. Be, because I, I mean, you you get to the, get to the hard problem of consciousness, and he kind he kind of takes his ball and goes home at that point. Yeah. But but yeah, he doesn't he doesn't believe that he he believes that the brain produces consciousness essentially. No, but, I keep telling you, dude, he doesn't believe consciousness exists. That's a, well, he believes that the brain actually no, he's yeah, he did say he did okay, yeah, he did say it's an illusion. Yeah, that's that's yeah. what I was trying to I, I I actually forgot what he said there, but yeah, he did he did yeah, he did say it was an illusion, but he does believe he will. That is that is the grand irony is that uh they they say have all their good words about free thinking and at the end they end up at, at uh determinism and and fatalism and a limitivist a limitivist materialism and so they say oh it's it's such a it's such an act of courage to throw aside the the easy comforts of religion well yeah, that we're... Would end up with a worldview that makes a mockery of things like courage since you're not actually choosing anything you're just, you're just another cog in a, in the machine yeah well I was, I was actually trying to remember like cuz I was trying to find a good way to put it like how they like how atheists believe and like about the brain and about like consciousness and I actually I actually while thinking about it I kind of forgot about Daniel Dennett and I was trying to figure out the definition of that and then I realized I, I forgot all about how he actually yeah did claim that consciousness is an illusion created by the brain how do you guys interpret I'll, I'll let you read that 2 Corinthians 4.18. What does that verse say? It's, it has it right here below, yeah. Oh. Yeah, so the things which are not seen, which would be like the new heaven and the new earth that's to come, or the like the eternal life we'll have with um, or like when we get to heaven, like for that temporary time that we're there, um, that's how I interpret the verse. Yeah, I, I guess there's a bit of figurative language here that he sees about, you know, looking at things that are not seen, you know, looking at things that are eternal. Yeah, they don't believe we have the freedom to choose. Yeah, that would be like... It, it almost like like a, 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 a prescient understanding of the first law of thermodynamics. Which is... The, that you know the 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 you know an open system tends to run down you know yeah yeah Let's see if I can find anything else here Har Harris is not uh, anything spectacular as a scientist he, he was a neural a great a neural scientist I think but that's it. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, he's not he's not uh, outstanding in his field. I, he's, yeah. I, these people are, are basically professional atheists. Yeah, like Richard Dawkins is absolutely terrible when it comes to philosophy. Yeah, I, I, and he's got, good, he's got good things on like evolution and science, but just. Well, he has he hasn't been a, a research scientist in forty years. Yeah, he. 
the even within even within you know neo darwinism things have moved out from where they were in the 70s so i mean what he did is no longer relevant you know the the selfish gene no longer relevant anything he had to say about about uh neo darwinism uh back then doesn't apply anymore so yeah what's a phd in neuroscience how you'll be yeah because and i guess that's why sam harris claims that we're more than that we're probably more than just the brain but yeah, it's still funny how he denies free will and how he says that like we're all just determined. Like, how can you believe that consciousness is more than your material brain and yet claim that we're still determined? I mean, that's kind of uh, seems very contradictory there. Yeah, uh, uh, Air Review says, I love how atheists hide from all the information coded in DNA. There is no way to have information without an intelligence programmer. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. This is all stuff that no one in the 19th century understood. And we, we, don't, we didn't even know what a computer was at the same time, but now we have, we have evidence that, that basically DNA uh, acts as, as a, you know information e encoding and decoding system, just like a computer. You know, people in the 19th century would have had no conception about that. You know, you know, there's actually a, I, I, if it's like a, a big think episode, but it actually, if you can find it, I might, I might share it with you. And it has uh, Richard Dawkins talking about crickets, and sometimes people take out the clip of of Dawkins doing the chirping of crickets. And you talk about different patterns of, of chirping, but when you watch it, you're you can actually think, "Wow, I I kind of like this guy." You know, he's talking about something he loves. If if Dawkins just talked to, uh, just stuck to talking about things he loved, you know, we would appreciate it because he's actually very endearing when when he's uh when he's just describing uh the things that he. His scientific research from before we were all born, basically. Yeah. Atheism uses the 19th century biology and chemistry to deny God. All the latest science proves complexity uh, and God beyond the possibility of random chance. In addition to that, uh, atheism also depends on 19th century biblical scholarship. Because you'll find that a lot of, a lot of the uh, things that atheists pass around is basically things, you know, uh, Jesus mythicism and, and all that stuff that basically had their vogue uh, in the late 19th century when people also believed in, in a static universe. Yeah, it was a... Um... <clears throat> yeah, and I don't, I don't see why... I don't understand why so many atheists have to be attracted to like Jesus mythicism because they won't claim that about Muhammad or they won't claim that about... But of course, it always has to be Jesus. Like... And of course, you know, they, they give or Bruno, they were, yeah. they were ridiculous to the outside world and to actual biblical scholars. I mean, that's why, I mean, I think like somebody like Robert Price, I mean, he has an actual degree in like New Testament scholarship. I, I think he's capable of being a good scholar, but he's not a good scholar because he's subscribing to this irrational. I, I, I like, this is the one idea I consider stupid and irrational. It's a stupid and irrational idea to claim that Jesus never existed because of all the sources we have and because he had such an influence on the world. But, you know, being one of uh, two Jesus mythicists uh, with uh, relevant degrees, uh, that's, you get, that you get gigs, you know, you get booked at uh, various conferences and stuff. So who knows? Maybe, maybe that's his ulterior motive. I, I'm pretty sure it's just all for the money. I really don't think it's a bad, they, 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 they just want money. That's, um, I'm just going to say, because, you know, I, I like how atheists always try to claim that, no, we just want money. Of course, that's not true. But, I mean, it would make sense if a Jesus mythicist would be wanting some sort of money. Like, you know, Joseph, have you heard of Joseph Atwill, by chance? Yes, he, they, uh, he's another hack with, with, uh, with a self-published book on Amazon, yeah. And he's, he's even, like, even Richard Carrier and Robert Price have responded to his book and said, it's just, this is like dumb and stupid. Like this, this mythicist writing to this mythicist who, and he doesn't have any new Testament scholarship degree at all. He's got a degree in business and yet he thinks he's an authority on the issue and he's not. 
Yeah, now there's there's a, a, a British publication uh, called the Express. Uh, I don't I don't know. It's it's some British publication. They actually wrote an article uh, citing him as an authority. So yeah, there are there are mainstream news sources that will cite these self published Amazon press hacks as authorities in their field. Yeah, because of course, because the media. Obviously, the media is not going to do research on anything. They're just going to see they're 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 going to hear about this idea from Joseph Atwell, and they're like, "Oh, I want to cover this because I'm already an atheist and I already don't believe that Jesus existed." That's also that's also a very clickbaity headline where you say, "Oh, a scholar says that Jesus does." Oh yeah, it. yeah. That get people clicking on your link. If you, if you, instead you say another scholar agrees that Jesus exists beyond a shadow of doubt. No one's going to click on that because it's just common knowledge. Yeah. One time Hitchens said he didn't believe Socrates existed. Oh, boy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Abraham Lincoln didn't exist either. That's actually that's actually a Facebook group. Yeah, yeah. I know. I, I, I like being a part of it. It's funny, but because we can just – anything that the mythicist says, we can say it about Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. And, be, and it'll work, too, because – if you apply any of their claims to history, it fails. And they won't say that. Even if there's one source, one source from for just like random king or random like general, they won't deny that person existed. But when it comes to Jesus, nah. You can have all the sources. Like you can have, you can have ten thousand sources for the existence of Jesus, and mythicists are still going to try to get around it. Reza Aslan, yeah, he was the, he was the guy who thought that Jesus was uh, a, another zealot. I mean, there's there's a tradition of of biblical schol of skeptical scholarship that says that Jesus was another zealot preacher, but uh, Reza Aslan has just been getting worse and worse over the years. He, we yeah. were watching the, the deterioration of a man in real time. I'm afraid. Yeah, and speaking of New Testament scholarship to all my um, viewers, if you want to read some good books on New Testament scholarship, I'd recommend well, Reinventing Jesus is a good one. Very clear, very just straightforward. Here's the facts. Um, then there's, um, yeah, there's Reinventing Jesus. I'd also recommend Dethroning Jesus, um, the uh, Fabricating Jesus. Um, uh, These are all like skeptical texts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does. At first, I thought they were until I read them, and I was like, "Oh, okay, this is just trying to." They're trying to create a catchy, like they're trying to make an appealing, to, like how Bart Ehrman said, misquoting Jesus because it's an appealing title. Yeah, um, yeah, they're trying to, um, they're trying to make appealing titles. I'm um, also there are a whole bunch of other books too on New Testament scholarship that I'm. Um, there's another book too called Jesus Outside of the New Testament, um, which goes over all the sources for um, Jesus outside of the New Testament. And then there's also Gary Habermas's book on the historical Jesus, and Bart Ehrman wrote one on the historical Jesus as well. Yeah, Dinesh D'Souza mentioned that the best uh, Socratic and Greek works we have are from a handful of manuscripts from the mid-1500s, and we have more New Testament fragments much older than that. Yeah, it's it's like uh, the Iliad or something. We The only, the first, earliest extant copy we have of these are from like 800 years after they were authored. Yeah, um, see, Jesus outside the New Testament, so Robert E. Van Morst, Craig Evans, Bruce Chilton. So, yeah, it looks like there's a lot of um. I'm trying to see if he's written any other. Uh... Okay, yeah, definitely. So from a yeah, just going over all the uh, and that book wasn't actually recommended to me. I actually, just I think I just found it, but yeah, it's on my to be read list. Um, true. Ehrman doesn't deny his circle Jesus at all. He thinks it's too foolish to do so. Yeah. Well, he also thinks that the New Testament um, manuscripts that we have, um, that if we were go if we were to go back to the originals, that they would generally say the same. Like they would, they would pretty much say the same thing. He actually admitted that in an inter interview. Um, so, I believe it was 
in the book dethroning Jesus in a certain edition of it. Or no, no, in one of his editions of misquoting Jesus. And you're not going to find it in the common version, but in in one of the editions, he actually did admit that um, if he were if he and Bruce Metzger were placed in a room together, and um, you know they were to go over what was in the original, they wouldn't really have like he admitted that there would be minor points of disagreement. So that shows that he he knows that the New Testament manuscripts are reliable, but he knows he can make money by misleading the public. And he does that with oral tradition because he knows that oral tradition is reliable too. But of course, that's why he won't bring it up in a debate with like Mike Lacona because. But Bar- Bart Herman actually said that, that the uh, earliest kind of creedal tenets like, you know, Jesus uh, uh, died for our sins and, you know, mm-hmm. all those were in place three years uh, after the crucifixion. Yeah. yeah. Because I read a summary of that book. Um, the, uh, how Jesus was changed over time, I guess, uh, where he tries to attack the oral tradition. He tries to use modern. So what he does is he interviews like modern day psychologists and psychiatrists, you know, people related to that field and try to say this applies to ancient history. And of course we can't do that because that would be, what would that be? That'd be an association fallacy, wouldn't it? Because I, I know that would be fallacious somehow because you're trying to apply this standard to an ancient standard that was completely different. Mm. But, um, but anyways, yeah, I would, I would say it's an association fallacy, but, um, but yeah, because in people in the ancient world could retain memory much better than we could, and they, they also took uh, copying manuscripts very, very, very seriously. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, yeah. especially if 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 it's the the central tenets of your faith. Uh, do you ever hear about the old uh, the old Jewish scribes? Whenever whenever they wrote wrote the name. Of, of you know Jehovah basically had to bury the pen or something. I haven't. Um, let's see if we can get one more question, then we can kind of wrap up here. I need to. Yeah, I mean, there, there is so eternal God comes in temporal flesh, but no man can see God as king. I mean, there are a lot of questions you can ask, like, is Jesus God or is Jesus the God's son? I, I don't know how useful it is to, you know, knock those around. Okay, so here we got to, I think the main atheist attack with our liberal culture um, is the Christian idea you can't go to heaven without baptism. How would you defend that? And do we deny anyone as good who is not Christian? So I actually talked about this with my youth pastor one time. So, yeah, a lot of Christians, that there, surprisingly, there are actually a lot of Christians out there who think that you have to be baptized or you have to do certain things or you have to do works to get to heaven. Um, but, of course, what what does the Bible say about it? Obviously, like, baptism is not... It's not a requirement. I mean, as Paul says, Paul says that if you confess with your mouth and believe that Jesus was who he claimed to be, and if you accept him as your Lord and Savior, you're saved because you can't save yourself, unlike in other religions, because nobody's perfect. Baptism has nothing to do with... Baptism is more symbolic than anything. It doesn't have anything to do with your salvation. Or it's not the, it's not part of the core tenet of salvation. Much like how works isn't either, but works should be an emergent effect of your salvation. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna have to say I'm gonna have to be out of here pretty soon. Yeah, so we can wrap it up here. So I'm gonna give a few quick announcements on my channel real quick. So I have uh, June third. I'm gonna have um, Rob Rowe from Sentinel. Sentinel Apologetics. Um, please get better announcing impromptu streams. Yeah, well, the thing is, is I I can only so I I have Facebook and I have Instagram. So if you want to follow me on any of those platforms, I can announce. You know when I'm. But I, I don't know how many of my followers on Instagram actually are subscribed to me on YouTube. That's why. Um, if you guys 
but if you guys if you guys find me on Instagram, it's um if you go to to my about section, I put my Instagram link in the description. So you can just find me on Instagram and I can post my um announcements there. But June third, I have a discussion with um Rob Rowe from Sentinel Apologetics. Uh, we're gonna be talking about the flood. Uh, June seventh, I'm gonna respond to John Steingard's deconversion. June 10th, I'm going to review Seigart's book, The Works of His Hands. June 24th, I'll have Dr. Seigart on to talk about um, his book, um, Atheism, Materialism, and Evolution. And then J July 19th, I'm going to be making um, it's your ultimate guide to understanding early Genesis. So that's what I have on my channel. I'm probably going to try to get um, Josh Rasmussen on to talk about his book. So... But yes, uh, oh, thank right, you. Right. He thanked me for for thank you and thank you, uh, thank you, Dylan. Oh yeah, yeah, you're welcome. Um, and yeah, if you wanna, if you wanna do it again sometime soon, or if you wanna do it again sometime soon, I'm always down. It's just I have to check my schedule since I have this planned. <laughs> This guy has it all down, Pat. He has it scheduled a uh, month in advance. Well, you see, in my interview with Inspiring Philosophy, he said how he had things planned until, like, 2021. And I was like, see, that's what I need to do. I just need to have things planned. That way I can... Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, uh, 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 thank you all. I mean, I mean, thank you so yeah. much. Uh, go, yeah. subscribe to def go subscribe to Deflating Atheism. Uh, if you're not subscribed to me yet, please do, or else you're going to go to hell forever. Jesus is going to torture you for eternity. And <laughs> I'm, I'm messing with you guys. But... Unless, unless you uh, contribute to my PayPal. Yeah. Or, yeah, if you contribute to my Patreon, then, yeah. If you pay me money every month. <laughs> All right, yeah, well, thanks for watching, guys, and I will see you soon. Have a good day. God bless.